uh, again, a thank you to our broadcasting committee to be able to get us into everyone's home. And thank you for welcoming me in, into your home today, uh, Rosemary and, and the broadcast committee. Again, everything you do is mu very much appreciated. And, and it's a big thank you to all that, that help in this regard. Um, as uh, Brian uh, mentioned, uh, well, let's start with this. We're, we've started in the book of Proverbs. The last couple of weeks, Tim brought to us a message on, on wisdom out of the book of Proverbs. And last week, uh, Mike brought us a message on the world and our relationship with the world. And today, uh, you know, I'm bringing a message on wealth. Uh, now, it's, it's somewhat, um, I guess, uh, opportune that as an accountant, and as Brian mentioned, uh, my background my career has encompassed wealth, whether it be counting it, measuring it, uh, securing it, making sure there's controls over it, and reporting it. So it's quite interesting that I take that perspective and look at the book of Proverbs and, and look at specifically today, I look at wealth. Um, you know, I've been studying Proverbs for many years and I've been blessed my whole life looking at Proverbs and understanding um, the instructions and the warnings and the direction direction that comes out of Proverbs. And I must admit, I've been blessed many times, not only uh, to for the right paths to take, but the right paths to avoid and the situations to, to stay out of. Um, wealth is a very complicated subject and we find ourselves one that it's all, it's relevant to all of us, but we are at different standards, whether it's uh, we're more elderly in life and maybe, you know, different perspective on where we stand and, and our comfort in it. Or maybe we're just starting out and we look at wealth a lot differently. Or maybe we have young children and, and wealth is a challenge because of the cost it is to raise a family today. So what I'm hoping to do is cast a broad net that has some relevance to allow us to look at different things today. But one of the things, and I'll just share my screen uh, now. So bear with me two seconds. And Rosemary, I trust everything's good there. So uh, again, this morning we'll look at, at wealth. Now, as I relate to the book of Proverbs, I just wanna go quickly through this. And I've enjoyed together with brother Tim and, and Mike to kind of look at what the book of Proverbs opens to us. And we talked about wisdom in the world and that was Mike and Tim's comments. And there's a whole bunch of W's I came up with. And today I'll talk about wealth, but there's, a, there's direction, guidance, and um, instructions on work, on wellness, on women, for young men and for wives, for warnings, and how we treat the weak. There's guidance, and those are my W's, for example, and then there's on friendships, there's on addiction and the caution of it, there's on children, there's on parents, and there's on age, there's much more, but I just thought I'd throw a couple on, and I've been blessed by reviewing the practicality of Proverbs. Now, let me start with a question, I guess, as we go into the issue of wealth, and that question is, if you could choose to be wealthy, would you choose it? If you could choose to be wealthy, would you choose it? And that, that comes from, despite the blessings that I have in my life, I sometimes catch myself thinking of how much better life would be if I had more. How many of us are in good situations, and we might even say we're perfectly comfortable situations, but find ourselves dreaming about maybe more money, more things, maybe a bigger house, a new car, and if you're like me, sometimes we have to battle those thoughts of wanting more, of wanting more. It's interesting because I came across this quote and it said, and it was a survey and it said as many as 80% of people worldwide believe money is capable of bringing them happiness. 80%, now that's worldwide, so there's poor countries, but there's also rich countries. And deep down there's, a belief, isn't there, that money can bring us happiness. Even as Christians, sometimes we fall into that. And we all want happiness, right? We all want to be happy. So we tend to fall into pursuing it more aggressively than we should. 
But thankfully, God knows this desire and is well aware that we sometimes hold wealth in a position that challenges him for his lordship in our lives. And Proverbs brings out directly that it challenges our thinking on wealth. It challenges our definition of what is value and how we think about how we can obtain it. See, in Proverbs, God gives us his view on how we should relate to wealth. So today, I want to look at four points. I want to look at what influences our attitude to wealth. What influences our attitude? I want to look at what God says in Proverbs about investment priorities. What does God see as our investment priority? And then God's measure of value, how critical God measures things and how his measures may be different than ours. And then finally, God's instructions for success. What are God's instructions for success? Maybe we should just open in a word of prayer before we start. Our blessed loving God and Father, you are so kind, you are so generous, and we thank you, Father, for how you care for us. We thank you over, most importantly for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for security of eternity through salvation in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for an opportunity we have through your Holy Spirit to open your word and to look at very practical discussions. To Father, to look at you, look at things about wealth. Father, it impacts each one of our lives. It, it creates joy. It creates sadness. It creates anxiety and stress. It feeds. It clothes. It does so much, Father. And you know how it important it is to us, and you know how it sometimes it occupies us beyond what it should. Father, I look to you th today to help me communicate my thoughts that you've br br brought out to me. Help me to clearly illustrate what you have in these passages for us. I thank you for the book of Proverbs. I thank you for your holy word that guides and directs in these matters. I thank you it's not subject to human thought and uh, um and human understanding, but Father, it's wisdom and guidance that you direct through your Holy Spirit. And I ask you for that help today. I pray for those that are listening, Father, that there'll be a piece of value for each one, uh, irrespective of what place they find themselves in life, Father, that it would be, there'd be encouragement and there'd be direction and guidance, Father, from your word. I just ask you for your help now as we spend these few minutes looking at this. And we thank you again for Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. So my first topic is what influences our attitude to wealth. As with many things, the world view and the world's view and God's view can be very different. And in many cases, they're opposing, they're opposing views. So for example, I mean, one of the things that, that I looked at is the paradoxes, right, that exists. So when Paul teaches, for when I am weak, I am strong, you see this concept that when you're weak, you're strong. And that's in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10. The other one that, that kind of came to mind was when the Lord Jesus talks about the wheat falling into the ground and dying, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit in this, this concept of death and then life. The worldview of wealth, I guess, is what I'm looking at is very different than God's, and we could generally expect it as it relates to his kingdom and how he defines it. You know, I Again, this chart, I'm not sure how it's coming out on your screen, so I'll go by, verse by verse, and I know it's a very busy slide. But what I'm trying to do is establish on the following slide three areas where the worldly view is very different from God's view. On the left-hand side, we have a worldly view where, where, you know, acquiring wealth is a good thing, and we can acquire it at all costs, where it's a very materialistic perspective, and where there's even a concept that wealth brings security. And on the, on the right-hand side is what God's response is to this stuff and or to, these, to these views. And so when we look at wealth acquiring at all costs, that top uh, left-hand column, the worldview, you know, the word, the Bible would tell us in Proverbs 23. And again, I'm going to note here that my, my overall focus is drawing out of Proverbs. And I do reference other, uh, um, other scriptures, obviously, because... Uh, they're valid and, and informative, but again, my view is to kind of focus on the pro on Proverbs. But Proverbs would tell us, do not toil or do not wear yourself out to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. Well, that counters the world's view that we should work hard and we should acquire, doesn't it? And then the other verse is, fear the Lord, for you, his people, 
for for uh, sorry fear the lord you his holy people for those who fear him lack nothing obviously these first verses relate to our human desire to acquire wealth at all costs now it doesn't apply to all so again it's select clearly these verses relate to someone that simply wears themselves out to acquire more this is not a reflection, obviously, of our current day where, for example, essential workers are working extremely hard to meet demand and to deal with other issues. It's not about working hard to serve. It's about working hard to make more money. But in contrast, Psalms 34, 9 says, fear the Lord for those that fear him lack nothing. I was struck with the contrast of accumulating excess wealth with the concept of measuring our situation with the fact that I lack nothing. There's a big difference, isn't there, by saying, I need more or I lack nothing. You know, the reality is when we look at our lives, I think many of us would argue, well, we really don't lack anything, do we? We lack nothing. We can, but we can be fortunate. We, we can recognize that that lack of nothing is as a result of goods, God's goodness, recognizing that his blessing are, are on our lives and recognizing that we can be thankful to him for placing us in a position of lacking nothing. I guess my point is on this, that can we not consider ourselves to be wealthy when we're in a position of lacking nothing? And I believe we can, and we have to recognize that in God's goodness. Now you might note that I've got a center line down those two charts where we have worldly and godly, and I have a gray line. And sometimes I think that about this gray zone that exists between these two worlds and many times you might think of the phrase that sometimes as christians we live with one foot in the world one foot in the world and i was thinking about that and again these are reflections on my own life so i'm not casting this on anyone else and uh, maybe i'm the only one that sometimes falls into that gray zone but i was thinking of that gray zone and i was thinking how would i rationalize myself being in that gray zone well, I would probably come up with a phrase that sounds something like this. I lack nothing, but I want to work a little harder to acquire a little more. And as ridiculous as that statement sounds, when you review it, I mean, that's our gray zone rationale, or that's my gray zone rationale. Moving on, when we look at the materialistic aspects versus the spiritual focus, I look at the verse in Ecclesiastes 5 and 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This so also is vanity. And then on the spiritual focus side, I, I looked at the verse in 1 Timothy where Paul talks to Timothy and says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. See, Solomon on one side was clear in his writing, and he should know he lived this based on experience where he gathered so much and still sat, had no, no satisfaction in it. But then on the other hand, Paul would tell us that godliness with contentment is great gain, great gain. When we talk about wealth, it's interesting to see how the Bible refers to wealth in different areas. But in this particular case, godliness with contentment is great gain. What's the gray zone in this particular comment? Well, I would think again of different things, but I would come up with a statement in a gray zone, something like this. I am content and I praise God. I am content and I praise God but I would be more content with a little more. That's a gray zone phrase. And again, we should recognize them as such. And then finally, we look at security. Wealth brings security. And we see in Proverbs, again, some clear statements about what God thinks about putting, uh, looking at wealth as security. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. And that's in Proverbs eleven twenty eight. 28. And then in Proverbs 23, it says, cast but a glance at riches and they are gone for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. So where do we look at for security as Christians? Well, we don't look at wealth, do we? No, we, the verse that, that, my mind always comes to when I think of security as, as a Christian. I, and again, it's John chapter 10, verses 28, 29. It's up on your screen, screen. And the Lord Jesus himself says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. 
no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And then further, it's, the Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So we know the world looks at wealth as security, right? And we all tend to feel more secure if there's money in the bank. We have some retirement savings or some pensions or at least some savings for a rainy day, day fund. We feel secure. It's prudent and it's financial planning. But God would tell us there's no lasting security in riches or wealth. However, God does assure us security of our place in heaven. And with, it, with our relationship with Jesus and God the Father, a double security as we saw in John 10. Secondly, Jesus tells us to lay up our treasures in heaven because we'll never lose those. That is real security, isn't it? But what's a gray zone conversation we may have between those two things? Well, as I said, we can always say, I trust God. And then I, I, I would add to it in a gray zone conversation. I trust God more than I trust money. It just alludes to the fact that we do put our trust in money to some degree, don't we? And that's not how God would have us do it. What's my point in this section? Well, our human nature is attracted to wealth and we are influenced to respond to wealth just as the world would. God wants to influence our view of wealth through the eyes of eternity and righteousness. What we think wealth can give us Abundance, for example, contentment, security, it can't. Only God can do those things. The next topic I want to talk about is God's investment priority for us. That's the second topic. God's investment priority for us. Well, it's safe to say that God knows everything. So it's safe to say he knows value. Throughout Proverbs, he continuously references silver and gold. And that's when he's making a point when he wants to bring uh, something out as to its value. So it's amazing, you know, when I looked at it to see how God uses silver and gold and that the fact that silver and gold has stood the test of time. In fact, I look back to see where gold was mentioned first in the Bible. And it's found in Genesis chapter 2 where there's a specific reference to gold. And if you're like me, when you look at a word and you study a passage, you read certain phrases that are familiar to you and you move on. And in this particular case, I was reading gold and silver and I moved on from the context that it just was to note, to denote value. But in particular, I stopped at this time and I thought, well, I better understand a little bit more maybe what the value of gold and silver is. So what I did, and these are just two graphs, and I don't know how clear they come out, but these are the left hand side is a graph of, of the pr value of silver over the last you know two months. And the right hand side is the value of gold over the last two months. And those charts would reflect increasing values. So in that regard, I, I looked at the value of gold on Friday, and it was $1,881 an ounce. And the gold and silver was $27 an ounce. So those are, are pretty good values, and you think, okay, well. You know, God's obviously got a purpose of referencing it. It still has value today, and we can still determine the value. But then I thought, okay, well, what does that mean? So if I took my cup of coffee I had this morning, and I said it was a 16-ounce cup of coffee, well, if it was gold, it would represent about $30,000, a cup of coffee for $30,000. If I looked at the bag of chocolate chips I have in my cupboard that I sometimes grab a handful out of, it's a two-kilogram bag of chocolate chips. Well, two kilograms of gold would cost about $132,000. And then we've all heard this expression of, you know, that person is worth their weight in gold, you know, refer referencing how helpful they are and how valuable they are. Well, if you take a person that's about 175 pounds, about 80 kilos, and you say, well, what would be their value in gold? It would be $5.2 million. So that is a person that, that, that's a lot of weight in gold. So what's my relevance? What, what's the relevance of this? I just want to express the fact that, you know, while gold and silver doesn't play a, a, a key role to maybe our everyday lives, we use money. 
The fact is gold and silver is extremely valuable by weight. And when God references it, he's referencing something of high value in relative terms beyond what we would otherwise imagine. And so I very much enjoyed relating that and saying, well, God's expression is beyond what we would otherwise think, well beyond. So where he takes gold and silver, it's one level, but he's well beyond that when he contrasts things that are better than gold and silver. In particular, God identifies in Proverbs 3 a couple of things that I want to focus on. In Proverbs 3, verse 13 and 16, he says, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. And long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. In Proverbs 8, he says, Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. And in Proverbs 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. In meditating on the value of wisdom, and I'm drawing the words out of these, out of these verses, you know, wisdom, understanding, God's instructions, insight, and he all relates those to silver and gold. As, as being of much higher value, of much higher value. Now, what's interesting about silver and gold, you know, it brings the concept of, I can purchase things with it. I can, it has sustainable value. I can hold it, I can store it, and I can save it. So it's really quite a tangible thing that we can relate to in our day-to-day. Whereas the other things, when we think about wisdom, we think about understanding, we think about insight, we think about obedience and instructions, those are more intangible, aren't they? And I was thinking, as I meditated through this, I was thinking, what if God could give us something tangible that would reflect wisdom and understanding and knowledge? What if there were coins or something that he would give us whereby we could then uh, accumulate them and store them. And where am I going with this? Well, I have a simple approach to things. And, I, and because we live in a tangible world, I looked at these and thought, well, God's comparing these to a currency to profit of silver and gold. And so does God look at these things as a heavenly currency, a heavenly currency? Because there are many things we can't buy with silver and gold. Can you think of a few? Well, I can. I can see that God's already said we can't buy silver and gold, or we can't buy happiness, sorry. We can't buy purpose. We can't buy health. There are a number of things that earthly currencies can't buy. But if I were to think of these heavenly currencies, currencies, there are so many things that these heavenly currencies, that where we can acquire things, so to speak, or where we can maintain things that money never could. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, for example, what about love? What about love? Well, we know there's no amount of gold or silver that can buy love, not true love. But when I think about the heavenly currency of wisdom, of understanding, of insight, even humility and obedience to God's instruction, well, where does that come from, love? Well, we know that God instructs us on love, and we had a beautiful message on or a reminder in first corinthians 13 about how important love is well it's through those heavenly currencies that i think love can grow and that love can be maintained and our selfish approach can, can be revised and so how important those items are in acquiring something that earthly currency could never buy then i also thought about peace i thought about you know can 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 i use my earthly currency to buy peace you know, and God says, no, my, my heavenly currency is much more valuable than the earthly currency. And what can it buy? Well, how much does peace cost? Well, it's, it's invaluable. But again, wisdom, understanding, humility, obedience to God's instructions and insight, those heavenly currencies. Well, where can I expend them? Well, I can use them to avoid an argument. I can use wisdom to avoid an argument. I can use understanding and insight to resolve a dispute. I can fix a relationship. I can maintain and enjoy peace through using those heavenly currencies that God sees so much more valuable than silver and gold. Well, a couple of points I just want to raise in this is our earthly bank accounts have no bearing 
to the amount of heavenly currency we have. In fact, we could be bankrupt in our knowledge and wisdom, in our insight, in our understanding, and have all the money in the world, but it's of little value. The amount of heavenly currency we have and use can influence our earthly bank account. Isn't that interesting? We see in Proverbs 3, verse th that first section, we see that long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. So the fact that we have these heavenly currencies actually can facilitate some of our earthly currencies, but not that it's a priority. And then finally, our earthly bank accounts can be empty. We can have no silver and gold, but we can be wealthy in God's eyes with heavenly currency. Now you might say, well, David, I, uh, you know, that's an interesting reflection. And, and as I reflect on where I am with respect to those heavenly currencies you refer to, I don't have many. I haven't really occupied myself too much with that. And I find myself maybe in a position that I'm, 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 I'm a bit uh, low or extremely low on this. So where do I start? Where do I start? Well, you know, heavenly currencies, if I can use that term and again, respectfully do so, whether it be knowledge, wisdom, understanding, insight, obedience to God's will, those heavenly currencies, there's similarities to the earthly currencies of how we, accumulate, how we get them. Well, first of all, we need to get them before we can spend them. So that's clear. Just like a job and we get money, then we can spend it. It's those currencies we need to do. We do the same thing. The second point is we have to want it. We have to want these heavenly currencies. We have to, and then the, the, the final thing is we have to work to get them. There's work to get them. I think of this, this slide here is where do we start? And God gives us opportunities recognizing, and again, he's so gracious and he's so merciful to each one of us. He gives us oppor opportunities to begin accruing or building our heavenly currency. He tells us specifically the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. He says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom the, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. He says humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. And the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom through, though it, all, though it cost all you have, get understanding. And then finally, in James we read, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And it will be given to you. What do we see in these verses? Well, in these verses, again, just to be, to be quick, in these verses, we see wisdom and knowledge start with the fear of the Lord. We know that knowledge of the Holy One is understanding from these verses. Understanding is such high value in God's sight that he would say that he, we, we shouldn't hesitate to spend all we have to get it, understanding. And then finally, God gives us wisdom just for asking for it. He doesn't judge our past, and he doesn't judge the fact that we lack it. What's my point? Well, God is merciful and gracious, and it's never too late to start acquiring our heavenly currencies of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and humility. God's instructions and insight. Now let's move on to the next point, the third point of God's measure of value. God is a righteous judge and he's able to measure value. He invented measurements. When we measure, we can judge amounts and values. What is more, what is less, what is better, what is worse. And we are constantly evaluating these things. So for example, when we buy a computer, when we buy a TV, a car, even running shoes, we look at consumers reports or internet reviews and we, it helps us to judge. I think we all agree that we look to trust the reviewers to tell us the truth and not to mislead us. We want an accurate and truthful measure of the product. When we look at God's perspective of measure, God measures things as well. And he tells us his view on measurement. And he says, all a, per, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. And it says, the Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. God detests dishonest scales 
and we can trust his scales. We sometimes look at values and situations and quite honestly, we aren't objective. We may not even be truthful and the scale isn't balanced. I wanna look at a, a few passages where God gives us insight into his measures and his measures of value and what's better and what's worth more and what's worth less. Now it's very interesting to see these slides because in the, when you go through Proverbs, you'll see a reference. And again, it depends on the translation. I'm using the New International Version. We'll see a number of verses that say, better is this than this. And it's interesting to note that all the betters are, are compared to wealth in most cases. So let's go through them. And I'll just read through them. Better is a little with fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fatted calf with hatred. Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. Better to be poor than a liar. Better is a good name than great riches. Better to be esteemed than silver or gold. Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. While Proverbs and the Lord spent a lot of time on this, gold holds many things above our earthly success, or sorry, God holds many things above our earthly success measured by wealth. While we all want to be good stewards with money, God doesn't hold our stewardship responsibility above some very basic principles. God doesn't need our money as, as we read this morning. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. He doesn't need our money. Nor is, he, is our stewardship solely related to wealth. From these verses though, what we do learn about God is that God would rather have us choose to fear him. He would rather have us choose to secure love and be loved, to be righteous. He would rather us be truthful, to have a good name, to be respect, respected and esteemed, and to be blameless rather than to pursue wealth and riches. In effect, these choices in my mind reflects God's desire for us to spend our heavenly currency, our wisdom, our understanding, our knowledge, our obedience to God's instructions and our insight to acquire and maintain these things on the left-hand side rather than to enhance our riches on the right-hand side. Because the right-hand side, because on the left-hand side, silver and gold can never buy them. Silver and gold could never buy them. Now, the last topic I wanted to talk about today, this morning, was the topic about God's direction for success. God's direction for success. I would suggest that these topics relate to obviously both heavenly and earthly currency. And I, I, I hope you don't mind, I continue to use the reference to the heavenly currency. So what's one of the aspects that looks that God looks to that to provide us success? Well, we can't get away from hard work, can we? In the verses in Proverbs that remind us of this, it says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. One who is slack in his work is a brother to one who destroys. And then where there are no oxen, the, major, the manger is empty, but from the strength of an ox come abundant harvest. I like to think hard work includes things like perseverance, dedication, faithfulness, loyalty. Whether it's for our employers, our business, it also extends to our daily devotions our Bible study, and our prayer life. The fact of the matter is, God blesses hard work. What do we get from these verses? Well, I think we get just talking 
leads, just talking leads to poverty. Well, God expects us to put actions, actions to be, to take actions, not just to talk about it. God doesn't want us to chase fantasies. He wants us, wants us to be realistic when we set our goals and when we set our objectives. Slackness is, a, is serious, you know. Slackness is serious and it's akin to destruction. I like to think of that as either we're moving forward or we're moving back. There's no such thing as staying um, there's no such thing as standing still. And so when we were slack, it gets closer to destruction. And then finally, growth comes with inconvenience. You know, you can have an empty ox stall and it can be clean, but you don't have the ox, the power of the ox to plant the field and the abundance of the harvest. But when you do have an ox in the stall, obviously there's the inconvenience of cleaning up for it, but there's, there's also comes an abundant harvest from it. So hard work, hard work is one of those things that we need to do. The other point, patience. What else does God want us for, to, to have for our, our success? Well, he wants us to have patience. In Proverbs 13, it says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. And the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. We saw earlier that we were to avoid fantasies and the get rich quick programs. God's plan is that we get money, our earthly currency, and I would suggest our heavenly currencies little by little and invest in them and have it grow that way. He warns us that hasty decisions can lead to poverty and patience has a, has a large role in, in maintaining these things. And that's patience. Now, my last item that I want to go through for God's instructions for success is something that took me a bit by surprise. It's generosity. Generosity. This is, it seems to be another paradox for me because as I sit and reflect on it, I see that there's this concept of giving and getting. Not that we should give to get, but in God's order, it's quite, it, 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 I marvel at it. The verses that that are in that Proverbs draws out is one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to po poverty. And then he says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. And finally, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Many commentaries acknowledge that these verses relate to both the earthly and spiritual worlds, that what we give on earth and what we give in our spiritual life are rewarded here and or in heaven. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, we give to gain, and that's not God's way. But God doesn't, but God def definitely recognizes our generous hearts and our giving for him. And what these verses tell me is we know that God's scale and measure ends up that we get more when, than what we give. That a generous person, and as a generous person, he looks, they, we prosper. That kindness to the poor is lending to the Lord. And that the Lord rewards our generosity. And I don't know how. And in our lives, it may speak differently. And that the generous will be blessed. What's my point? Well, God wants us to be generous. And he blesses us for it in different ways. But this is where my biggest challenge was. And I can speak for myself. You know, I was thinking about lifestyle. And I was thinking, well, if I'm leading a lifestyle that leaves no or little money to be generous or no or little time to be generous to those in need, what's the answer? Well, it's the answer is to change my lifestyle. Am I sacrificing generosity for the accumulation of wealth? And those were questions that I had to ask myself. And we read this morning, Matthew 26, 
verses 37 to 40, Dave, Dave read them this morning and was talking about providing something for the poor. And it was a reflection that you, the Lord Jesus said, you did it for me. You did it for me. So what's my conclusion? Well, in conclusion, I want to just say the, my thought is what the Lord said in Mark 6 and 36. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, acquire all that wealth and power, yet forfeit their soul? There's of no value. God recognizes our human desire for wealth, but instructs us that there are other priorities that define wealth that we should be more focused on. Wisdom, knowledge, understanding, God's instructions, insight, humility, our heavenly currencies that go beyond the value of earthly wealth. He wants us to acquire these things, and it starts by having a, relation with, a relationship with him. It all starts with him. Reminds me of verse uh, of uh, Jesus's statements in Matthew 6. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here we just uh, look to the Lord in closing. Our blessed loving God and Father, I thank you so much for an opportunity we have to look in your word. I thank you for the wisdom that comes out of Proverbs. I thank you for your instructions on wealth. And I thank you for your reference to silver and gold and how much there's so much more value in other things than silver and gold. I thank you for the heavenly currencies that you seek for us to acquire. And through your help, I thank you that we can just ask and you'll provide us wisdom. You'll provide us these currencies that help us for things that we can't use silver and gold to buy, that it's meaningless. And thank you for the opportunity to use these currencies for eternity, to build our treasures in heaven beyond our treasures on earth. Father, I just ask you for help to, and for my own priorities, the ability to set your values in my life and your priorities to set the importance of these things and the ability to work hard to do them. Father, I ask you for help to be generous and to be kind and to see these things with your eyes. Father, I thank you for your word, your faithfulness in it. I thank you for the Lord Jesus, and I ask you to bless these words and these thoughts to your honor and to your glory. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen.